Welcome to NTD News Today. I'm Kevin Hogan. Let's take a look at our top stories. The first shipment of baby formula from Europe is coming soon. We hear from a doctor who's been affected and lawmakers on both sides grill the head of the FDA. Title 42 will end on Monday, May 23rd. Some are warning that this will create a greater crisis at the border. Among them are the head of the Border Patrol Union and Florida's governor. In Oklahoma, the nation's most comprehensive abortion ban could soon be signed into law. Find out what lawmakers are saying about it. President Biden is paying a visit to Asia this week. Find out what challenges are overshadowing the trip and what the president is expected to talk about with South Korea's leader. The Biden administration is bringing in the first shipment of baby formula from Europe in the coming days. The hypoallergenic varieties will supply about one and a half million eight ounce bottles. It's good news for families and doctors who treat children with allergies. And today's Jessica Beatty has more. Doctors who treat children are frustrated over the baby formula shortage. I'm angry at the situation that how this has arisen. And then I'm very sad that I am doing less than what I can to do the best care for my patients. Dr. Mark Corkins treats digestive disorders in children. Many of his patients are on special formulas, and a lot of those formulas are made by Abbott. When they uh, recalled all their formulas, then there's this huge crisis, mad scramble, switching formulas, trying to figure out what'll work for different formulas. Uh, and, and then some of them don't talk, well, a lot of them didn't tolerate a different formula until you have to try something else. Dr. Corkins had to admit two children to Le Bonheur Children's Hospital for dehydration because other formulas weren't working. They had to be fed intravenously. He says they're doing much better now. He says Biden's moves to help the shortage are great, but they'll probably take weeks. Meanwhile, nearly everyone in Washington is angry about the shortage. The head of the FDA told lawmakers Thursday that Abbott's formula plant could be up and running again soon. It was shut back in February. We had to really wrestle this to the ground with Abbott. And I think we are on track to get open within uh, the next uh, week to two weeks. Both Republicans and Democrats grilled FDA Commissioner Dr. Robert Califf. They asked why it took the FDA months to investigate a whistleblower complaint about safety violations at the plant. It all begs the question, why did the FDA not spring into action? Who received the report at the end? at the FDA. What did they do with the report? Califf responded, saying he couldn't share details due to the agency's ongoing investigation. Lawmakers weren't happy. It's not acceptable to say that you can't comment on it. Just four companies produce about 90 percent of U.S. formula. Lawmakers and Califf agree that makes the U.S. formula market highly vulnerable to disruption. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. The Biden administration is ordering over $100 million worth of monkeypox vaccines. It comes after the first case of the viral disease was reported in the U.S. The administration has ordered millions of doses of vaccines to protect against smallpox and monkeypox. The order totals $119 million. The order comes after the first case of monkeypox was confirmed in Massachusetts on Wednesday. Monkeypox is caused by a virus. It is typically limited to Africa, but now it's been found in several countries with over 25 cases reported this month. The vaccine order was placed with a biotech group based in Denmark called Bavarian Nordic. They will convert their liquid vaccine into a freeze-dried version so it has a longer shelf life. The vaccines will be manufactured and invoiced in 2023 and 2024. The smallpox and monkeypox vaccine goes by the name Janeos in the U.S. The administration has the option to place another $180 million order of the vaccine under the contract. That would be for about 13 million freeze-dried doses. Those would be manufactured by 2024 and 2025. The company says the bulk of those doses has already been made and invoiced. What's more, Australia confirmed its first case of monkeypox. It's a man in his 30s who recently returned from the U.K. He was diagnosed with the disease in the state of Victoria. The state's top health official says he was positively confirmed overnight on Thursday. According to the Victorian Health Department, monkeypox does not spread between people easily, though it can be transmitted through lesions, bodily fluids, or contaminated materials. The health minister of neighboring state New South Wales says there also may be a case there. Monkey virus is uh, not a brand new virus uh, that's circulating here, but it is the first time it's come to Australia. 
Symptoms of monkeypox usually last about two weeks to a month. About 1 in 20 people die from it. New South Wales officials say they are taking steps to manage and prevent any future cases. A morgue in Arizona is bearing witness to the border crisis. It processed over 200 bodies and remains of unidentified illegal border crossers last year. How will things change with the end of Title 42? Let's find out. The Pima County Morgue in Tucson, Arizona has processed the bodies and remains of 211 unidentified border crossers last year. And there are currently around 100 active investigations. But will the situation change after the Biden administration lifts Title 42 on May 23rd? I don't know, because the, the group of people that we find that are deceased are, um, um, they're not family groups seeking asylum. It is uh, usually males in their 20s and 30s, um, full camouflage, overclothing, carpeted shoe covers. So that, that demographic may not change necessarily in regards to Title 42. Title 42 is a pandemic era policy that allows Border Patrol to quickly expel illegal immigrants on public health grounds. It has blocked more than 1.7 million illegal immigrants at the southern border in the past two years. The head of the Border Patrol Union warns that Border Patrol will be even more overwhelmed once Title 42 ends. Here's what he told Fox News in an interview on Wednesday. When you look right now, we already start our shifts with 50% of our resources not even per, per, um, performing uh, enforcement activities. They're in administrative duties. Once this explodes, we're going to have nearly 100% of our, of our people doing administrative duties rather than enforcement duties. That's going to give complete control to the cartels. That's a scary situation to be in. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis on Wednesday predicted that things will become worse once Title 42 ends. He says he will sign new laws in the upcoming weeks to prepare for it. That any of, if there's contractors that the federal government hires to dump illegal aliens in Florida, then those contractors forfeit the ability to do business with the state or with local communities. And we're just not going to do it. If Biden is busing illegal aliens into our state, we're taking those buses and rerouting them to Delaware and other jurisdictions. The Florida governor says that states should be allowed to handle the border situation on their own. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Oklahoma could soon have the most comprehensive abortion ban in the U.S. Lawmakers in the state passed a bill that almost totally bans the procedure. NTD reporter Jeremy Sandberg tells us more. Lawmakers in Oklahoma approved a bill on Thursday that prohibits all abortions in the state with very few exceptions. This after a Supreme Court draft opinion was leaked earlier this month, suggesting the court is moving to overturn the landmark 1973 Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion nationwide. The bill could reach Governor Kevin Stitt's desk as early as next week. We still hope and we, we still have faith that there's an opportunity and a possibility that our Oklahoma State Supreme Court that's the court where we file our cases, um, will um, find in our favor and strike these bills down or these laws down. The governor says he will sign any anti-abortion bill sent to his desk. The law will take effect immediately after he signs it. Abortion clinics in the state say they will stop performing the procedure as soon as the bill is signed. The new legislation bans abortion from the moment of fertilization. When we try to force the issue to reduce the abortion rate, all we do is disperse it elsewhere. Exceptions will only be made in cases of rape or incest reported to law enforcement or in a medical emergency. The bill does not apply to the use of birth control or morning after pills. Republican Representative Wendy Stearman, the author of the bill, says the argument used to be about when the point of life begins, but has now shifted to the possibility of the child having a difficult life. Based on that argument, it makes more sense, in my opinion, to offer abortion services up until a child is 18 years old. Because until they reach, a, reach adulthood, we don't know if they're going to be a productive member of society. Oklahoma enacted a law earlier this month that bans abortions after six weeks of pregnancy. The law allows private citizens to sue anyone who helps terminate a pregnancy. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. Thousands of ballots with blurry barcodes can't be read by vote counting machines. This will delay results for weeks in a key U.S. House race in Oregon's primary election. The fiasco affects up to 60,000 ballots. That's two-thirds of the roughly 90,000 ballots returned so far in Clackamas County. 
Hundreds of ballots were still coming in under a new law that allows them to be counted as long as they were postmarked by Election Day. 200 of the county's employees were getting a crash course Thursday in vote counting after being redeployed to address the crisis. The county spokeswoman admitted to Portland TV station KATU that it's not a quick process. Election workers are implementing a painstaking counting procedure that could draw the election out until June 13th when Oregon certifies its vote. By Wednesday night, workers had counted over 15,000 votes. An election integrity group is suing New Jersey's Secretary of State Tahisha Way for allegedly violating the National Voter Registration Act. The Democrat politician is refusing to disclose voter roll documentation. The Indianapolis-based Public Interest Legal Foundation says it needs to view the documents because recent studies show thousands of New Jersey residents possess duplicate, triplicate, or quadruplicate voter registrations. The Public Interest Legal Foundation describes itself as the nation's only public interest law firm dedicated wholly to election integrity. The group states that it has brought lawsuits and won victories in multiple states. Before filing suit, the group told Way's office that there were widespread errors in the voter roll. There were thousands of examples of registrations stored in duplicate. Tens of thousands of other voter records were missing or contained false biographical information. The group says Way's office stonewalled. The group isn't the first to complain about the state's lack of transparency on voter registrations. A Republican state senator also expressed concern to Hishin Way in a series of letters. Former New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio is running for Congress. De Blasio made the announcement Friday on Twitter. He says he's running in the 10th Congressional District of New York. De Blasio served two terms as New York City Mayor from 2014 until last year. His run comes after a redrawing of the 10th district, which pushed Democratic Congressman Gerald Nadler into a neighboring area. New York's primaries were originally set for June. They have been moved to August due to legal matters involving the district's mapping. With midterm primary elections underway, what are the key issues for voters? Inflation is near the top, but what about China? We hear from a Washington think tank on how the stances of these candidates on the superpower will affect the polls. Please welcome Stephen Azell, who is the Vice President of Global Innovation Policy at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation. Thank you for joining us, Stephen. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Many analysts, including yourself, are saying that a critical issue for voters is going to be whether or not they are tough on China. Can you elaborate on this? Well, listen, since China joined the World Trade Organization in 2001, the United States has accrued a $6.8 trillion trade deficit with China. On balance, trade with China has cost the United States 1 million manufacturing jobs in the past two decades alone. So China is certainly going to be an important issue for American voters come the fall, especially in states like Ohio, Pennsylvania, the industrial Midwest, where U.S. manufacturing sector has been hit very hard by the consequences of Chinese innovation, mercantilism, and unfair trade practices. In the era of the pandemic, we have seen that onshoring jobs has become a big topic. Now let's look at the Republican primary for U.S. Senate in Pennsylvania. According to the Wall Street Journal, Mamet Oz mentioned China over 8,000 times in his ads, whereas his rival, David McCormick, was about three times less than this. Do you think this will make a big difference in a state like Pennsylvania? I think it will. I do think we have to recognize that at the moment, the issues that will be on the top of the American voters' mind in Pennsylvania or the rest of the U.S. come November is going to be inflation. It's going to be the economic state of, 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 of the, the, the state of the economy. Uh, and to the extent candidates like Mehmet Oz are able to connect uh, an unfavorable state uh, of the economy to the Chinese actions, then I think it will be very resonant with voters. Yes. And let's talk about Biden's trip to Asia. Do you think that this will signal to voters that Democrats are taking China issues seriously? I think it will signal that. On the margin, however, uh, I think that uh, those issues are going to be playing more with Republican voters than with Democratic voters necessarily. 
And while it's a step in the right direction for Mr. Biden to be visiting Asia, I think the larger question will come out of the China trade policy review, the uh, under the, the ongoing USTR analysis of the Section 301 tariffs on China. And so will the Biden administration really unveil its own China policy before the elections? I think that's going to have a much more significant impact about how the voters will evaluate uh, the merits of the Biden administration's China policies in the months ahead. What advice do you have for American voters heading up to the midterms? Prize candidates of either party that exhibit competency, responsibility, and integrity. Uh, we need policymakers in Washington, D.C. of the highest intellectual, moral, and technical caliber uh, because the United States faces many international and economic policy issues that we need the best people here in Washington representing our country. Stephen Nizel at the Information Technology and Innovation Foundation, thank you for your analysis. Thank you very much. On Thursday, a former top FBI official testified in the trial of Hillary Clinton campaign lawyer Michael Sussman. The prosecution says Sussman lied to the FBI, illegally hiding his ties to the campaign. He's accused of falsely telling former FBI general counsel James Baker at a 2016 meeting that he wasn't there on behalf of any clients. Baker testified that Sussman gave him information allegedly showing then-candidate Donald Trump's ties to a Russian bank. Baker told jurors he's 100 percent confident Sussman told him he wasn't providing the tip on behalf of the Clinton campaign. He also testified that, quote, there was nothing there between Trump and the Russian bank. Prosecutors say this was a ploy to try to dupe the FBI into investigating the claim to get press coverage. During cross-examination, the defense is expected to point out that Baker has changed his story over the years. The trial is the first courtroom test of special counsel John Durham's three-year investigation into potential misconduct tied to the FBI's Trump-Russia probe. And coming up, Chicago police shot a teenage boy who allegedly was involved in a carjacking. We bring you the details of the incident and the ongoing investigation. And the remains of what may be a U.S. World War II pilot are returning home from a rice field in Thailand. There are 72,000 U.S. service members still missing from the war. He could be one of them. Stay- Another troubling day in Chicago, a 13-year-old boy is suspected of being involved in a Tuesday carjacking. An officer shot him as he ran from police on Wednesday night. He was unarmed. Now an oversight committee is investigating. The Civilian Office of Police Accountability is investigating the officer's shooting. The boy is at a local hospital. He is in serious condition, but he's stable. The police superintendent, David Brown, describes the encounter. Several officers pursue the individual on foot. The subject flees to a gas station parking lot at the 800 block of North Cicero and turns toward the officer. The officer then discharges his weapon, striking the individual once. Brown said his department is fully cooperating with the accountability office's investigation. We're not going to speculate. This investigation will reveal the facts. COPA will do a thorough investigation with our department's full support. Brown did not provide many details of the incident. All officers involved in the shooting have been placed on administrative leave. According to the superintendent, police began pursuing a vehicle that was involved in a Tuesday carjacking, one in which police say four people stole a car with a three-year-old girl inside it. The girl's mother clung to the vehicle as it drove away and broke her collarbone as she fell after being dragged. The car was abandoned a few minutes later and the girl was unharmed. Brown suggested it's not right to jump to conclusions before a thorough investigation is carried out. He said the officers and the boy will make statements. Some local media reported that the boy was shot in the back, apparently contradicting what Brown said. Investigators are reviewing body cam and security camera footage. They said they cannot release the footage because it involves an underage person. Two people were shot following high school graduation ceremonies near Grand Rapids, Michigan. A 16-year-old boy and a 40-year-old woman were injured after two people in cars exchanged gunfire. The shooting occurred after 7 p.m. Thursday at East Kentwood High School. About 60 students and their families and friends were at the school's stadium. School officials said the shooting happened following the graduation ceremony. 
The boy is from Texas and the woman is from Grand Rapids. The teenager was shot in the wrist and the woman was shot twice. They're both in stable condition. Authorities say the suspects immediately fled the scene. The school's high school leaders released a statement describing the shooting as an isolated incident. In a Los Angeles nursing home, two Holocaust survivors meet, but this may not have been their first introduction. Here's the story. Do we recognize After nearly 80 years, two survivors of a Nazi labor camp met in Los Angeles. The reunion was sponsored by the American Jewish Congress. A great, great pleasure that somebody is still alive who went through the same thing what I did. The two native Hungarians distinguished themselves in their respective fields. 96-year-old Frank Schatz is a writer who still pens a weekly column for the Virginia Gazette. And 101-year-old George Bercy made his mark as a pioneering surgeon in Los Angeles. He still goes to work and he still reinvents himself despite what happened to him and the horrors that he experienced. Um, and I am humbled to be in their company at this time. Schatz presented Bercy with a book he had personally inscribed. In a recent column, Schatz wrote that he was a slave worker building railroads for the Germans in the Carpathians. He managed to escape during an air raid. Bercy said he was a captive of the Nazis in the summer of 1944. He was able to escape after a nearby attack by U.S. and British forces distracted prison guards. Schatz learned of Bercy's story from the Los Angeles Times and the two spoke on the phone. Since then, he had been planning a cross-country trip for an in-person reunion. Bercy says they are fortunate to remember the historical events which are still relevant today. We should help each other and today is a certain era in uh, history where we need any help that we can give. The decreasing number of Holocaust survivors is difficult to estimate depending on how a survivor is defined. The U.S. Holocaust Survivors Registry now has the name of more than 195,000 survivors and their family members. The remains of a U.S. World War II pilot may finally be coming home after nearly 80 years. That's thanks to a chance discovery of old records in Thailand. Here are the details. The remains of a World War II U.S. pilot missing in action since 1944 may have been discovered in a rice field in northern Thailand. U.S. and local authorities held a solemn ceremony at an airbase in Thailand on Wednesday before flying the remains to the U.S. You know, it's keeping the promise that we never leave a person behind. Um, you know, it's... You know, anybody who served in combat in any way, who fight alongside somebody, regardless of, you know, country or nation, there's a bond that's built. And um, we owe it to the families to provide those answers and to bring those people home. An archivist at the Air Force Museum in Bangkok found the document leading to the discovery of the remains. In 2011, the museum was inundated with water following massive floods. So he went through the archive file by file, checking for water damage. He then found a handwritten policeman's report dated November 1944. It detailed the crash of a U.S. aircraft. Yeah, he may know that he, I'm looking for him, searching for him for a long time. So he maybe that uh, he tried to help by just put that pages, uh, those pages uh, just in front of me, put in that file. It took almost 10 years to get from the discovery in the archives to the actual excavation. A search team broke ground in a rice field in February this year and found a multitude of small metal fragments, teeth, and bones by April. The remains will undergo lab tests in a special facility in Hawaii. No one knows for certain yet whose remains are inside or even if they're human. In the case of World War II, I mean, we're approaching the 80th anniversary of World War II. So um, being able to get that information so our historians and analysts and researchers can develop those cases, is, is, it's, it is definitely a race against time. Thailand had been a target of U.S. bombing during World War II, and thousands of airmen flew missions over Southeast Asia in the war. Roughly 72,000 U.S. service members are still missing from World War II. Around 47,000 of them went missing in Asian battle zones. The U.S. Navy is honoring the only Filipino to be awarded the Medal of Honor by naming a new warship after him. A future Arleigh Burke-class guided missile destroyer will be named USS Teleforo Trinidad. Trinidad was awarded the Medal of Honor for his actions on January 21, 1915, aboard the USS San Diego. On that day, the Navy says one of the ship's boilers exploded during testing, setting off a chain reaction. Trinidad rescued one of his shipmates from the area, suffering burns in the process, and then returned to help another. Five sailors died that day, and a total of seven were injured in the accident. Trinidad was born in 1890 in the Philippines. Filipinos weren't allowed to enlist in the Navy until 1901. Trinidad died 
in 1968 at age 77. Aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln is maintaining a presence in the Indo-Pacific. It's part of a U.S. effort to counter Beijing along with its Asian allies. And international schools in China are seeing a mass exodus of foreign teachers as Beijing clings to its zero COVID policy and strict lockdowns. Stay tuned for more right here on NTD News. Secure, the true solution for your digital privacy and security. Secure is a private and secure messaging and email solution hosted in Switzerland using military-grade encryption and Swiss privacy laws, giving you true privacy. Secure is 100% private and does not collect or sell any of your personal data. Secure's Helix technology connects you securely to our Swiss servers without the need of a VPN, guaranteeing privacy and security for all your communications. Secure Messenger doesn't require your phone number or any personal data that hackers target. Chat by Invites allows you to chat privately and securely with anyone outside of your secure network without the need for others to download Secure. Secure Send offers you a private and secure way to email anyone outside of Secure. You won't find this level of privacy or security on any other email or instant messaging application. Visit secure.com. Regain and protect your privacy today. Larry Elder here, and I've got some great news for you. If you're tired of the censorship in this country, then you're in luck. You can go over to EpicTV.com and watch honest programs that don't spin the facts. EpicTV.com is a brand new, no censorship video platform where you can watch not only my show, but other deep documentaries, great program, wholesome movies that you can watch with your entire family. So head over to EpicTV.com. I'll see you there. NTD's Capital Report. It's about getting answers. Cutting through the fog of politics. It's about your questions and our chances to ask. What is the net impact of the American cars from Graves? Thank you for joining us. We're speaking to those in power to find out what does this mean for the people. We're here so you are in the know. President Joe Biden chose a Samsung chip factory to start his South Korea tour. This was the first stop on his inaugural trip to Asia as U.S. president, a major step to deepen ties with Indo-Pacific allies in key areas. A critical component of how we'll do that, in my view, is by working with close partners who do share our values, like the Republic of Korea, to secure more of what we need from our allies and partners and bolster our supply chain resilience. Biden's visit came only 10 days after South Korean President Yoon suk yeol took office. The two leaders met in Pyeongtaek, south of Seoul, and visited a nearby Samsung factory. It was a highly symbolic move to boost cooperation amid growing competition from China. That's especially so in the face of global supply chain disruptions and post-pandemic semiconductor shortages. The Samsung complex is one of the world's largest semiconductor manufacturing facilities. The plant also serves as a model for the new Samsung plant being built in Taylor, Texas. Biden, in a later speech, said investment from Samsung will create 3,000 new high-tech jobs in Texas. Biden and Yoon will meet again Saturday in a virtual summit to discuss the full range of security and economic issues. President Biden's trip to South Korea is going to test the tough talk on China by the newly elected president of the country. Yoon suk yeol faces a tough balancing act between maintaining strong ties with the U.S. while China remains its largest trading partner. Biden's trip comes with a tumultuous backdrop. For one, the U.S. is grappling with China's refusal to condemn Russia's invasion of Ukraine, and there are tensions between Beijing and Taiwan. Beyond that, North Korea is ramping up its missile tests. White House National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan describes Biden's trip to South Korea and Japan. This will be his first trip as president to the Indo-Pacific, and it comes at a pivotal moment. President Biden has rallied the free world in defense of Ukraine and in opposition to Russian aggression. He remains focused on ensuring that our efforts in those missions are successful. 
One big focus for Biden's trip is countering China's growing economic influence in the region. According to Politico, he needs to coax allies into security and economic alliances to achieve this. He'll be working to gain support for his Indo-Pacific strategy and economic frameworks. It's seen as a delayed response from an administration that came in with a focus on China. The withdrawal from Afghanistan and the largest conventional military attack since World War II in Europe drew a lot of attention. According to former National Security Advisor Michael Green, who served under the Bush administration, the Ukraine crisis woke up U.S. allies in Asia. That includes Japan, Australia, South Korea, and Singapore. He says it has opened their eyes to the threat of aggressive states attacking democracies. And so I think President Biden goes to Asia at a time when he can say, yes, we have a lot on our plate. We have to deal with the crisis in Europe and we have growing challenges in Asia. But for the first time, really, in the post-war era, our allies in Europe and our allies in Asia are coming together and recognizing that we all have something at stake um, in a global uh, challenge to democracies from authoritarian states. Green cited opinion polls in Japan and South Korea saying public distrust of China is high there. Green hints at how this may help the administration handle North Korea. And um, the one thing that will help them is because Japan and Korea are so aligned with us now, they will be able to put forward a very united front with our two most powerful allies in Northeast Asia. And of course, Australia and Europe, NATO and others backing up that effort, which will help because that'll put pressure on China to, 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 to rein in the North Koreans more. The White House predicts North Korea will conduct another missile test while Biden is in the region. The aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln has maintained a presence in the Indo-Pacific for months. It's a visual show of force in the region meant to keep an eye on China's growing military presence, but also to deter nuclear-armed North Korea. Here's more on the story. If you ask United States 7th Fleet Commander Carl Thomas, this is what deterrence looks and sounds like. Deterrence to date has worked, uh, and I'm hopeful that it continues to work, but my job is to be prepared in case it doesn't. For the past several months, the U.S. Navy Carrier Strike Group 3, led by the USS Abraham Lincoln and armed with the U.S. Navy's most advanced fighter wing, has conducted joint drills with allies like Japan and patrolled the waters of the Indo-Pacific. Being out here operating as a very visible, a very agile, uh, dynamic force Uh, There's no better way to provide the deterrence that we need in this part of the region. We need to have a more robust, uh, like-minded states coalition uh, because China's rise is now the global phenomenon. (laughs) A reality that isn't lost on quad member states, a coalition made up of the United States, Japan, Australia, and India, whose leaders are set to meet in Tokyo early next week. With South Korea watching from the sidelines, Member states are likely to discuss a unified response to Russia's invasion of Ukraine, the recent flurry of weapons tests conducted by North Korea, and of course, China. One of the things that China doesn't have is friends and allies. They have subjects. We have friends and allies who want to stand shoulder to shoulder with the United States. But according to Cleo Pascal, an Indo-Pacific strategic specialist, the key to combating China's rise isn't necessarily through military strength. By the time you get to the military part, you're almost too late. You, you don't want to cut off China militarily. You want to block its influence politically and economically first. However, as China and Russia work to strengthen their own military alliance in the region, Rear Admiral J.T. Anderson says the U.S.'s presence, along with the strength of its allies, has proven to be an effective deterrent. Nevertheless, if that deterrent fails... Our job is to fight and win, period. An outcome no one wants, but one the U.S. military and its allies must prepare for. International schools in China are struggling as foreign teachers and families leave the country in droves. Here are the details. International schools in China are facing an exodus of foreign teachers and students, with some in the industry saying certain schools will not survive Beijing's pursuit of COVID-0. Travel curbs, lockdowns and increased regulation are all contributing to the woes of the sector. About 40% of teachers are expected to leave mainland jobs this year, up from 30% last year and 15% before the pandemic. 
Alexa Moss is the head of early learning at an international school in Guangzhou. She says they are struggling to replace the teachers who are leaving. Now that we're in the 2022 recruiting season, what we're finding a, a new pattern emerging of teachers and leadership and basically all constituents in international schools are choosing to leave China. So that candidate pool within the country has shrunk. So it's harder to recruit within China and it's hard to recruit outside of China. So that finding quality staff has just been really tricky, um, particularly in this recruiting cycle. International schools can be lucrative business with fees sometimes exceeding $44,000 a year. They are seen by middle-class Chinese parents as a way of improving their child's chances of winning a place at a top global university. But in recent years, some have avoided emigrating as China was largely free of COVID. Now, as the country faces a resurgence of the virus, foreign families are choosing to return to their homes and others have put off moving to China altogether. Tom Olmert, is executive director of the Association of China and Mongolia International Schools. Many heads have told me that they have been spending up to 300 hours or more trying to recruit teachers to come to China. But now people around the world have been reading about the lockdowns and just don't feel a need to subject themselves to that. So they take jobs elsewhere. On top of this, Beijing has moved to limit foreign influence in the education system. This has meant that some schools have had to grapple with changing regulations. Recently, a Beijing school affiliated with the English public school Harrow was forced to drop its famous brand name. And London's Westminster School has dropped a plan for schools around China. North Korea's fever cases have surpassed 2 million since late April. The country announced the first Omicron variant cases on May 12th. That's according to North Korean state media, the Korean Central News Agency. The death toll stands at 65. It is unclear whether the recorded deaths were caused by COVID-19. North Korea has been reporting daily new fever cases, recovery and death cases through its state media. More than 200,000 fever cases were reported this week. However, the latest confirmed COVID-19 case number announced by its health authority remains at 168 as of May 14th. Just ahead, Ukraine's president says his country's Donbas region has been destroyed by Russian forces. The region has been the focus of Russian military action. And Australians at home and abroad are watching a tight election race. The current prime minister hopes to stay in office while the challenger and labor leader makes inroads. All- We are being censored. America's news outlets no longer provide the truth. 90% of news outlets in the United States are controlled by six corporations. They're not out to tell you the truth of what's happening. They're out to tell you the picture of the world that they represent. The Epoch Times is independent. We're not controlled by any special interest and we never will be. This is a battle, a battle between truth and deceit. A battle between forces that would ensnare this country in ignorance and between a media that wants to present you with the truth. Subscribe today to our digital edition at theepochtimes.com and join the Americans who are seeking truth and tradition. Read the difference in all your devices. We'd love to have you on board.
Ukraine's president, Volodymyr Zelensky, says the Donbass region in the southeast has been completely destroyed. The region has been a recent focus of the Russian offensive. That's as some of the world's richest countries pledged billions to give Ukraine a boost. Moscow's war effort has pulled back its forces from near the capital, Kyiv, and moved its artillery to the east. Zelensky says this is piling on pressure in the area. Constant strikes on the Odessa region, on the cities of central Ukraine, Donbass is completely destroyed. All this has no and cannot have any military explanation for Russia. Moscow calls its invasion a special military operation to rid Ukraine of fascists, a claim Kiev and Western allies say is a baseless pretext for an unprovoked war. Meanwhile, the U.S. Senate also recently approved $40 billion in aid to Ukraine, by far the largest U.S. aid package since Russia invaded. And the group of seven wealthy nations have pledged to bolster Kiev with $18.4 billion. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen told reporters, quote, The message was, we stand behind Ukraine. We're going to pull together with the resources that they need to get through this. Separately, U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken accused Russia of using food as a weapon by holding hostage supplies for not just Ukrainians, but also millions around the world. The war has caused global food prices for grains, cooking oils, fuel and fertilizer to soar. The EU has said it is looking into ways of using the frozen assets of Russian oligarchs to fund the reconstruction of Ukraine, while the U.S. has not ruled out placing sanctions on countries that purchase Russian oil. No snow and fewer delegates are expected to descend on the Swiss mountain resort Davos for the annual meeting of the World Economic Forum. The meeting is normally held in January. It's a meeting of government, business, and other leaders. It has been postponed due to the difficulties of holding an in-person conference during the CCP virus pandemic. But this year, delegates can pack sandals instead of ski boots for a rare springtime version of the event. Construction crews have been finishing pop-up networking facilities, and soldiers have been erecting security fences. The World Economic Forum says the meeting will bring together more than 2,000 leaders and experts from around the world, but it will still be somewhat smaller than some past meetings. No government or corporate bigwigs from Russia were invited because of the Ukraine war. The conference is set from May 22nd through the 26th. As the Australian general election approaches, candidates will head to the polls on Saturday, hoping their campaigns were successful enough to gain a majority. It's a tight race between current Prime Minister Scott Morrison and Labour leader Anthony Albanese. Here's more on that story. Polls from Wednesday show Australia's federal election has become too close to call. The ruling Conservative coalition narrowed the gap with the main opposition Labour Party. Australian Prime Minister Scott Morrison will head to the polls on Saturday, hoping his campaign has encouraged voters to keep him in the top job as the 30th Prime Minister of Australia. Born in Sydney in 1968, he rose to national prominence for his tough stance against asylum seekers as Shadow Minister for Immigration. Morrison won both praise and condemnation, particularly from the UN High Commissioner for Refugees, for its implementation. He rejected bids by two Chinese companies in the $7.7 billion sale of the country's biggest energy grid, Ausgrid, after they failed to overcome security concerns. His opponent, Anthony Albanese, became leader of the Australian Labour Party and Australia's opposition leader in 2019. Born in Sydney in 1963, he studied economics at the University of Sydney, where he first got involved with student politics and was a member of Australian Young Labour. Albanese was selected as the leader of the House of Representatives in 2007 when former Labour leader Kevin Rudd was elected as Prime Minister. He was then appointed as Deputy Prime Minister in 2013 before the Labour Party was ousted in the general election three months later. Albanese is a backer of renewable energy, is an advocate for the LGBTI community, and describes himself as a Republican in support of replacing Australia's constitutional monarchy. In contrast, the Morrison-led Liberal National Coalition has urged voters to focus on unemployment at its lowest since 1974. Center-left Labour has put spiking inflation and slow growth in wages at the forefront of its campaign. Australians living in the Bay Area are voting in Australia's upcoming federal election by casting their ballots at the consulate. They're also celebrating by eating democracy sausages on the street. Here are the details. The Australian national election is Saturday, May 21st, and voting is mandatory for all citizens. Australians living in California are casting their absentee ballots at the Australian consulate. What issues do they care about the most? One of the decisions about making my decision 
uh, was was evaluating who actually is looking at the holistic approach to Australians, not just those there in Australia. Uh, had many debates in the last couple of years about have they, did they do the right thing by shutting the borders. You know, people like me were stranded, uh, didn't see family for two years, so that's always a bit hard. I think the way that the pandemic has been handled um, uh, is one of the factors that I considered and then uh, our treatment of refugees as a country, uh, those are kind of some of the big things that came up for me. Yeah. The Australian Consul General says the number of citizens voting at the consulate appears to be a little lower this year. I think that's because uh, there aren't as many Australians here as tourists. Uh, some Australians who have been living here may have moved elsewhere in the US because of COVID and working remotely. And then some Australians who are living here have gone back to Australia permanently because of COVID. One of the voters reflect on the difference between democracy in the U.S. versus in Australia. I think living in America, it kind of opens up uh, the other side of the voting system uh, that we don't have in Australia, where it is, uh, we have compulsory in Australia and it's not compulsory here. And so I think it kind of makes you value what we have in Australia. And uh, I think the process is good. People vote who they like and we end up with, uh, hopefully, uh, the people that the majority of people want in there. And in Australia, selling democracy sausages is typical at voting stations, often for fundraising. Members of the Golden Gate Australian Football League were grilling them outside of the consulate. Well, they were, I think that's what, eight or nine sold? I was very surprised to see the democracy sausages, something that I'm very excited about now to head over and have a sausage. Um, so, yeah, everyone please come, come down and vote. <laughs> the Football League says it's an incentive to getting Australians to vote in person. Still to come, the NASA Mars rover is about to begin its next phase of work. The Perseverance rover discovered what is believed to be a delta, and it will return rock samples back to Earth. We'll have more for you after this short break. A portrait by Renaissance Venetian master Titian was thought to have been lost. However, it was recovered by Italian police, who announced it is now the property of the state. The masterpiece, called Gentleman with a Hat, disappeared in 2003 and was thought to have been taken illegally to Switzerland. Military police General Robert Riccardo said the painting had been used, been returned from Italy from Switzerland for restoration. It was then seized by police at the headquarters of a courier in Turin in 2020. The painting is valued at over $7 million. Ricciardi says since was illegally exported, it is now the property of the Italian state. Boeing launched its Starliner spacecraft on an uncrewed test mission toward the International Space Station Thursday. The Starliner is designed to ferry astronauts to and from the ISS. Two prior attempts at such a mission failed. Boeing's goal is to prove the Starliner can dock at the orbiting outpost. The aerospace giant must succeed at that before it can move on to missions with people on board. Roughly half an hour after the Starliner's launch, Boeing confirmed its orbital insertion. That's a sign the spacecraft is on the right path. It will spend about 24 hours free-flying before arriving at the space station. It's carrying supplies for the astronauts already on board the ISS. The hope is that it will remain there for less than a week Boeing originally hoped the Starliner would be operational in 2017, but the program had some delays and development hang-ups. Scientists working on NASA's rover mission on Mars are entering a new phase of their research. They're going to discover if there is life on the planet or not. Here are the details. The Perseverance rover arrived in February 2021 at a crater on Mars in search of rocks that could contain evidence of past Martian life. In the first year of its mission, the rover conducted reconnaissance of its surroundings and eventually discovered what research scientists confirmed as a delta. They tell us that a river once flowed into this crater, filled it up to form a lake, and then kept flowing to eventually form this delta out into the, out into the lake. Uh, and that's really exciting because we're telling us that there were, it was in fact a sustained ancient habitable environment where ancient microbial life could have lived. But it's also really great for uh, preserving biosignatures, preserving things like organic molecules from that ancient life. The rover will begin the next phase of work, which involves returning samples of rocks back to Earth. But the process is long and drawn out, and the samples won't make it back to Earth for closer inspection until approximately 2030. 
At some point soon, we are hopefully going to lay down a set of these tubes to cache them on the surface for eventual return to Earth. Uh, and that'll actually happen through a series of other missions. We call this Mars sample return. And that'll happen through you know another small rover coming out to grab the samples, putting them on a little rocket, which will launch into orbit, rendezvous with another satellite, and then eventually return that back to Earth. Meanwhile, another NASA mission on Mars known as InSight Mars Lander is expected to end by the end of this year. The lander had been operating on the red planet for four years. During the mission, the lander detected more than 1,300 Mars quakes. Good news is we, we learned something new about the soil of Mars. Uh, the bad news is we weren't able to get down more than just to, to, to be able to, to bury the mole itself. And we weren't able to get our heat flow measurement that, that we had wanted to get. Scientists have also been able to measure the depth and composition of Mars's crust, mantle, and core. The principal investigator of the team says they've been able to map out the inside of Mars for the very first time in history. A photo from the Hubble Space Telescope was released this week, giving us a look at a glittering gathering of stars thousands of light years away. Astronomers say the stellar assembly was captured in the constellation Sagittarius. The star clusters are tightly bound collections of possibly millions of stars. They are not unique to this constellation. Scientists say they can be found in a wide range of galaxies. Astronomers are studying the clusters to gain more insight into how they are formed and how they evolve. Mercedes-Benz just made history, confirming on Thursday it recently sold the world's most expensive car. The very rare 1955 Mercedes-Benz SLR Coupe was sold to a private owner for 135 million euros, the equivalent of $142 million. Haggerty, a company that tracks collector car values, says that makes it the priciest set of wheels ever. The previous record was reportedly $70 million. That was for a 1963 Ferrari 250 GTO in 2018. The record-setting Mercedes was sold at an invitation-only auction on May 5th. It was one of just two of its kind, claimed to have a top speed of 186 miles per hour. The other one will remain at the Mercedes-Benz Museum. Mercedes says the money from the sale will be used to establish the Mercedes-Benz Fund, a global scholarship fund. You know yourself just how hard it is to put that phone down, especially releasing it from your hands. Imagine then how much harder it is for your teen, especially when they're at a critical stage of their favorite game. Here's Gina Marie who brings us Strong Mind and Body. Mindfulness and meditation might be popular right now, but they have a big competitor, digital distraction. Did you know that kids now spend more time on screens than sleeping? And of course, if you add the threat of pornography and online predators, we are dealing with a big problem. Another problem that looms large is chronic stress. It can lead to personality changes, anxiety, depression, and teen suicide. The urgent nature or speed of the games can affect their hormone and cortisol levels and cause adrenaline to surge. This can result in higher blood pressure and an increased heart rate, or to fight a virtual enemy. The cultural idea that every child should have a smartphone needs serious reconsideration. Every video game and social media platform is designed to keep their users hooked. Every parent's role is to make sure your kid isn't one of them. Too much time spent in the virtual world shapes the structure of the brain. Overuse of the fight or flight system becomes stronger. The game becomes the child's new family. In the real world, your child may overreact to a real life situation. But trying to reason with a gamer is out of the question too. You may need to take the tough love approach. Your child or teen may not thank you now, but they will thank you in the future. And even if they never thank you, at least you played your role as a parent. The issue is that chronic stress from gaming and social media stops your child from learning new hobbies, exploring healthy interests and detachment from their family relationship. So what's the best solution? Remove the stimulant so the brain can reset and heal. Is that easy? No, but it works. Fill the void with family-based activities, encouraging friendships and building life skills. Choosing this road less traveled will result in a happier family life. 
Community is calming. Isolation through constant device use stresses us. Enjoy the rediscovery. And now to Iowa, where a wild deer decided to check in on a rec center on Thursday. Surveillance video caught the woodland creature sliding through a hallway at the Carroll Recreation Center. The city's Facebook page joked the deer was in to sign up for some of its awesome afternoon classes. The deer jumped through an open window and ended up leaving the same way. Carroll City officials say the deer needs to knock on the door like everyone else the next time she wants a day pass. Thank you so much for joining us. We're going to put our email address on screen. We'd love to hear from you. For podcasters, that's news.today at ntd.com. Until next time, Kevin Hogan, NTD News, New York City. Thanks for watching us on YouTube. Did you know YouTube only keeps selective videos on its platform? So if you want to make sure you get the full picture, just subscribe to our newsletter. Go to newsletter.ntd.com and sign up. It's free.